Okay, so welcome to Gilgulim part five. And I want to begin with a disclaimer that is very important. No one should ever believe someone that tells them that he knows what their Gilgul is, unless that person is a super tzaddik and everyone knows this individual is righteous and he's a huge Talmud Chacham and, you know, a gadol and you go see one of these people. But if you hear from a regular run-of-the-mill person, oh, you're a Gilgul of this, you're a Gilgul of that, just... This is a disclaimer, it's a warning. Don't believe those people. There are people out there that will claim to know who's a Gilgul of who, and some of them are dangerous, and they might have ulterior motives, and they might try to swindle the person or manipulate the person. Um, there are stories of this happening. Very often, unscrupulous individuals will use Kabbalah or the concepts that are within Kabbalah to entrap others uh, in something that's not good. So a person just has to be ready that, you know, a lot of people that might watch this, they might think, oh, Gilgulim are so interesting, and then they might meet someone who says, you're a Gilgul of this, and they might feel so special. Wow, I'm a Gilgul of that person from Tanakh. How did he know that? And he says, oh, I know. And terrible things happen from that. For example, Shabtai Tzvi. Shabtai Tzvi was told by Natan of Gaza that he was Mashiach, and that he was a Gilgul of different Mishamas, and he had to do this and that. And there's many sad stories in Jewish history where unscrupulous individuals use the concepts within Kabbalah to convince the masses of something that is untrue and they wrap their lies in Torah and the deeper the concept the more uh, efficient they are in peddling their falsehoods and therefore a person just needs to be very um, wary of when they hear people speak about any of these things in a practical way. We can always quote stories of Gedolim and Tzadikim that spoke about Gilgulim and that they knew that this person was a Gilgul of this, but on a practical level, if anyone actually comes up to you and tells you that, so you should uh, think they're, at first glance, you should think they're crazy. And then if you've looked into them and they check out to be big, big Tzadikim and big Tamir Chachamim, so perhaps you can believe them. And it's strange why they would tell you that. That's also something you have to wonder. Generally, people don't like to reveal who's a Gilgul of who, unless you're living in the times of the Arizal. Um, it's not something that is looked positively upon to go tell everyone who their Gilgul is. Hashem will always ensure that one person's Gilgul will have all of the circumstances that it needs to reach its rectification. And you don't need to know your backstory in order to accomplish that. You'll just know because you know Hashem will ensure that you get to the right place. So who told Shabbat Tzvi? That he was that Gilgul? It was an individual Natan of Gaza, who was also known as a Kabbalist and uh, knew a lot of Torah, but he, I don't, we don't know why he did it or if he really believed it or not, but that led to a serious, terrible situation in the Jewish people with a false messiah. So it's just an example of one of these things that happens. Um, there is, you know, some popular, I'd call it alternative medicine, that there's people out there that will heal you based on your Gilgul and that you have this neshama in you and you're attached to that neshama. Um, unless you know that it's a very, very respected individual that has serious rabbis behind him, those are also things to stay away from. Um, but they do exist and sometimes there might be, well, I don't know of any that are, that are you know, have rabbis with their haskama that, that are behind those people. But uh, that's also something just to be weary of because Whatever, you hear, now that we're doing the Gilgul Shir, I don't want to be the cause of people to go and seek Gilgul assistance <laughs> with these individuals, and not all of them are good, most of them are probably not good, and maybe even if they know something, who says it's coming from the side of purity? It might, they might be attached to impurity and impure forces and, and the, the dark side, whatever, these kind of things, so even if they do know, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're doing something positive or that they are trying to help you. Okay, so that's just our disclaimer, which I think is it's funny, because... It's like, oh, that's never going to happen. It's like it actually happens. So you have to be aware of that. Okay, that being said, now let's talk about Gilgul. Um, okay, so tonight's topic will discuss people that were Nisgalgil, or what is the concept of Gilgul reincarnation in objects or life forces other than humans. Very often we see in many of the sources that people will be reincarnated as animals, for example dogs, cats, it actually discusses in great detail in many Kabbalistic forum what a person does, what sins he does that cause him to be reincarnated into what animal. That happens quite often. Not only that, but people are also reincarnated into food very often. Into food, into plants, into fruits, into meat and fish. We'll see what a person has to do to 
be reincarnated into food, and that's something that is foreign to most people that are thinking reincarnation. Reincarnation means this person came back as that person, and therefore they're always a human that's trying to rectify things. That's also not necessarily true. People can be reincarnated into any object in the world. There's even cases where they're reincarnated into domen, into rocks and inanimate objects. Um, that's more of a punishment that they have no ability to rectify themselves. But very often the rectification will come through using those objects or those foods for holy purposes. That would be how you get rectified through an animal or an inanimate object, because obviously you don't have free will if you're an animal or an inanimate object. So you're not going to be the one that's going to choose how to rectify your past life, which is what we would assume with the human reincarnation. But if you're reincarnated as an animal, an inanimate object, or a food, so clearly you're not making any decisions. So you have to hope that Hashem causes you to be put into a situation where your soul will be rectified. So... Let's start with a story, a very interesting story that is brought in the Sefer Haredim. So again, the only stories that I bring are really coming out of this Sefer, and all these stories in the Sefer are brought from uh, verifiable Svarim and legitimate Svarim and Tzadikim, and therefore that's where I'm getting my sources from, but to find something you know, on the internet or on YouTube or something, we can't verify that it's um, legitimate. So that's where I'm pulling all these stories from. So this story is found in the Sefer Haredim, which is a mainstream Sefer that many people have heard of, many people learn. And he discusses a story that took place many years ago in the city of Castile in Spain. And in Spain, they're famous for their bull fights. The matador fights the bull. And most kids just see like the cute you know, Matador dressed up very nicely, and he has the red thing, and the bull runs by, and oh, he missed, oh, he missed. Little do they know that what they actually do is, like, stab the bull with a sword every time he runs by, and they essentially torture the bull to death, and at the very end, they castrate the bull, and then they kill him. So it's not a pretty sight uh, for those who have ever been to these things. Uh, not a place for a Jew to go, so certainly don't recommend ever attending one of these things. It's probably us are to go and forbidden, but that's what happens. So these bulls are not lucky animals. <laughs> This is one of the worst fates you can have if you're a bull, because not only are you goaded into trying to attack someone and missing and experiencing that frustration, but they're also putting these bulls through extreme pain and then ultimately killing them. So it's not something that you want to go through. So here in Castile, Spain, there was a certain bull that was owned by a group of non-Jews that were going to use this bull in one of the in one of the bullfights in Spain. And this bull was getting ready to fight the next day and he was locked in his pen and in that very same city there lived a Jew and this Jew had a dream that night and in his dream his father came to him and his father told him that due to my many sins I was reincarnated as a bull and I am now stuck in this pen owned by a bunch of non-Jews that are going to torture me to death tomorrow and that is going to be my punishment for my sins but they gave me permission to reveal myself to you and to ask you this favor. And he said, I need you to go and to redeem me at all costs. No matter how much money it costs you, you pay them whatever they ask for this bull. And you make sure that you save me from these non-Jews and from this fate. And then I want you to take me and I want you to give me a kosher shechita. I'm going to shecht me api halacha and make sure that I'm kosher meat. And I want you to take the meat of this bull and I want you to feed it to poor Talmud HaChachamim poor Torah scholars. And in that way, through their eating of this meat, my soul will be elevated, and I will have the ability to come back as a reincarnation as a human being. And when I come back as a human being, I'll be able to rectify my soul and to serve Hashem. And that is indeed what happened, and that's what this person's son did. So that's found in the Sefer Haredim, in this book. So we see an example of souls that are reincarnated as animals, and, uh, and they are saved. <laughs> they have sometimes even have the ability to speak to their relatives in dreams to tell them how to save them. Now, just interesting to note that I also found in this safer a source for who comes back as an ox. So this is an interesting case. Who comes back and is reincarnated as an ox? So it's an it's an individual, a man, who sang frivolous songs with a woman. If he is part of a male female choir <laughs> and they're singing frivolous songs so then that is one of the sources that says that he's actually reincarnated as an ox this is in the Sefer Rikanti and he says why is that the punishment because there is an Isser in the Torah you're not allowed to muzzle an ox while he's threshing while he's working the grain because it's 
painful to the ox to have to see all that food and not be able to eat it. So you're not allowed to muzzle him, you have to let him eat while he's working. So he says that that halacha is to lighten the punishment of this individual that came back for singing with women, and therefore he is bad enough that he has to come back as an ox, so we're at least not going to muzzle his mouth <laughs> while, he's, while he's living as that ox. We'll at least let him eat and have his mouth open, um, but he'll be back as an ox, so it will not be pleasant for him. So that's what it says, who comes back as an ox. So I don't know about mixing the two stories, but perhaps that's what that individual did to come back as that ox. So we see that individuals come back as animals. Another uh, reason that people are reincarnated as animals is actually very famous and it's brought in many, many stories is because of Lashon Hara. Lashon Hara and adultery. Those are two sins that cause a person to come back as an animal. What animal specifically? Dogs. So the Zohar, there's probably 20 sources in here that discuss individuals being reincarnated as dogs for speaking Lashon Hara or for having znus, for having illicit relations. So that causes a person to come back as a dog because a dog is brazen. It barks, it doesn't control its mouth, and therefore mida connected mida, tit for tat, you have to come back. This person has to come back as a dog and experience life as a dog. So in Kabbalah, we're not big fans of dogs. We assume that they're destructive forces, but generally it's not an ironclad rule. You could have an Ashama that came back as a dog, and his tikkun, his rectification is for a Jew to somehow, I don't know, feed him Shabbos food. <laughs> Whatever, we'll see soon different rectifications. We don't know why, but obviously every dog finds its owner and that is part of its rectification. So, you know, there's that interesting phenomenon, I forget what it's called, where the dog looks like its owner. Bowser, is that what they call it? The dog looks like its owner, so you think it's random, but if you believe in Gilgulim, so it could very well be that there's some connection between that soul, maybe a relative. We'll see that um, when it comes to reincarnation, very often relatives are people who are connected to an individual in a previous life, so they will, they will be the food animals and human beings that they're that these indiv- that everyone is surrounded by are generally souls that are connected to their soul and that were connected to their soul in a previous life because we spoke many times about the fact that life is replaying itself um, and we're trying to rectify things that were done in the past so obviously if we wrong someone in the past so to rectify that that soul needs to be in contact with the soul in this life so therefore it's assumed that all the souls that a person is surrounded with were connected with them in a previous life Certainly the person they marry, their children very often um, are connected to them in previous lives. And therefore, uh, so relatives or even dogs or animals or pets that people own, you can already assume that there's probably some reason why that animal found you or that person found you, right? You can assume that. Not only does it work on the individual level, but this is just a very, very interesting concept that I just will read to you. That's explained in the Bir Hagra. So sources don't get more legitimate than this. The Vilna Gon himself said this. And he says, Everything that occurs in the written Torah. So everything that happened with the Avos, Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, and the Shvatim, and Yosef, and the whole story, all the stories that take place in the Chumash, in the book of, books of the Torah, and with Moshe Rabbeinu, through all of the from Midbar and Devarim, everything that happens with him, and Yisrael, and all the events that happen with Kala Yisrael. Kulam heim b'chol dor vador. They replay themselves in some way in every generation. Every generation has its own Moshe Rabbeinu, it has its own Egel HaZahav, it has its own Matan Torah, it has its own battle with Amalek, there are all the different stories that you can go through in Tanakh, you can look through everything. So it all happens in every generation. Shekulam misgalgalim nitsoiso sehem bechol dor vador ki adua. All of the sparks of previous generations are reincarnated into later generations, and they have to go through those same episodes to rectify what took place in the previous life. Like we said in the last year with the 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva, being the guild of the 24,000 um, from the Shevet of Shimon, and the story of Asa and Dina, and Zimri and Cosby, and all of those different connections that took place. So that, that's not limited to previous generations. He says, every generation. And everything that happens from Adam Rishon until the very end of the Torah, happens in every generation, which is known to those who have this deep understanding. So just when I pointed out that the souls that you interact with are connected to your soul, it's not just that, the whole Jewish people, everything that took place in previous generations, it's replaying its, itself on some level. We can't really see the story, but the same plot line is, is replaying. Uh, 
feel like there's some movie where there's like a storyline that happened in the olden days and then it's happening again in the modern times and the movie keeps going back and forth between the same story that happened, you know, 500 years ago that's happening now. So you can almost do that in every generation, essentially. It's going to look very different. It's going to be a modern version of the story, but the characters and the plot lines and the villains and the heroes are all going to be the same. They're all going to be the same neshamas, or sparks of those neshamas that came down into the world, and that's said by the Vilna Gaon. So that's a very fascinating concept. Uh, so you could try to like pinpoint in every generation when those things are happening. For those yeah, of you on Purim, we discussed, sorry. yeah? Sorry, just jump in, but um, what, what, like, this information, it's, most people don't know it. So you don't know what you're living out, who's with you. you we, I mean, it just Yeah, we said it's not important, and you, you missed the beginning, but we said you're not supposed to know it, and, oh. you, and you don't have to know it. It's going to happen. Oh. It works on autopilot. But only the sages know it, like the Vilna Gohan. He obviously studies it. Or yeah, he knew it. But he's those few people, but you're saying, well, I, I missed the beginning. Yeah, we don't know it, then we're not supposed to know it, and you shouldn't try to figure it out. <laughs> it's better not to know. God will work it out, and it'll, it'll, make, it'll, it'll make itself happen on its own. But unless you know a tzaddik, and we said it has to be a very, very special person that tells you this, and for whatever reason, like the Arizal. But to have a normal person tell you this, or a regular rabbi say you're a Gilgal, we said to be very wary of that. And it's uh, a lot of um, people are manipulating others, and they are... Because present- it's not true, it may not be true? It may not be true, yeah, it may not be true, and they could use it to trick people, and it's not good. And nobody would do, no, no logical person, even if they did know those things, would reveal it to a person, unless they had a very special reason, like you're the Arizal, and you know why you're sent to this world, and you have to tell people. But it would be very, very rare and strange for that to ever happen. So usually assume that the person is a fake, or that you weren't supposed to know that anyway. Yeah. So when we said dogs... Another attribute of dogs is that dogs are brazen. They're very brazen. They pretend they're people. They'll eat food right off the table. They'll lick you on your face. Most animals have a little bit of uh, respect. <laughs> they have their, their boundaries and their borders. So that's a person who, had, who committed adultery, Lush and Hara. Those are people without borders and boundaries. They're, they're brazen. They'll do things that are clearly you know, not okay, and they'll speak when they shouldn't be speaking. So that's why they come back in a dog. And in a very interesting sefer, Midrash Talpiot, in the name of the Arizal, he actually says that if you know someone who has no shame, they're very brazen. You know, there's people that are famous today even on uh, YouTube or prank shows, they just, they'll just go up to anyone and say anything. Like they don't have any shame whatsoever. No boundaries, no borders. So he says you should know it's, it's guaranteed that they were previously reincarnated as an animal. And an animal, in general, in general animals are much more brazen than a person. They'll do whatever. They don't, they don't have any boundaries or borders. They don't have any self-awareness or... Uh, or, right, that they don't have any of, of the shame that a human being has. So he says that if a person doesn't have that, that means that he was an animal in the previous life, and he's taken those character traits with him into his next life. And that you can tell that that person was certainly an animal in his previous life. So that was, after you're reincarnated into an animal, you're not necessarily done, right? Is yeah, yeah, not done. You're usually not done. Like we saw in the story here, that's usually a step down. <laughs> that's usually a punishment. And we said that your, your rectification is not going to happen through your own free will when you're reincarnated as an animal. It has to happen, God has to give you a gift, so to speak, to ensure that your rectification takes place, which we'll discuss now about how that takes place. But in this story, we saw that that person was going to actually suffer even more pain by being tortured and fed to non-Jews as a non-kosher animal, and his tikkun, his rectification, was that he was able to warn his son and then have himself shechted with a kosher shechita and then be fed to Port Hamidah Chachamim, which is obviously where he wanted to be, and then he was able to come back as a person. Mm-hmm. So that was his, since he got rectified as the animal, he was able to go up a level and now come back as a person. So, okay, so now we'll get into people who are reincarnated as foods in particular. Because then you clearly have, I mean, at least animals, you say, even if they're on a free will, they at least make choices and they, I don't know, they interact with people like in an <laughs> intimate way that people know them and speak, I don't know. But, uh, anim- but food's clearly not. <laughs> it's a food. It doesn't do anything. So what is this concept of foods? So in the Sefer Prichayim, he writes, first let's discuss the general concept of food in the world of Kabbalah and, and how it describes eating. So first, you see in many places in Chazal, in the Gemara, in the Talmud, in Kirti Avos, that we, we hold eating on a pedestal. It's not just uh, consuming fuel so that you can keep going. Eating is something much more elevated. Uh, the Gemara says that two people eat at a table and there's no Debrei Torah between them. It's like they're eating from the sacrifices of Avodah Zarah. 
or it's like they're, they're dead people eating at a table. Let me learn it there. So that's clearly not a good thing. So right, you see, eating is a very, very elevated thing. We call our shulchan our mizbeach. We say that since the karbonos were nullified and we don't have the base of mikdash anymore, so now our table itself becomes our mizbeach to bring up sacrifices to God. So that's obviously a very high, high statement to make for something that's animalistic like eating. And even take a step back, God could have easily made mankind without the need for food, which would have made a lot more sense. Your job here in the world is to get things done, to learn Torah before mitzvahs, so why waste so much time eating? So much time preparing food and eating food, just have your body naturally regenerate its energy. I don't know, there's probably animals out there that don't eat, or photosynthesis, photosynthesis. you just go outside and you bask in the sun and then you can now have energy to keep going. Why did God make a person have to have food? So he explains in the Sefer that the, the general concept of food is that God places holy sparks into food. Food has two components to it, just like the human body has a soul and a body. So there's a physical component and a spiritual component. So too, food has a spiritual component and a physical component. You, when, you're, when you eat food, so your body does two things. Your body absorbs the nutrients and the vitamins from that food. So it's like it's, it's sucking the good and expelling the waste. But your soul does the same thing. In the good vitamins, the good nutrients, and the nutritious elements of the food is also hidden the sparks of vitality and holiness that are contained within that food. So when your body is sucking out the good, your neshama is also sucking out the good. And there's a life force in food. That's why everything we eat pretty much has some sort of life force in it, except for salt. There's certain things we do eat that are from the world of mineral and not from the world of plant or animal. But even those become elevated through a person's eating because he extracts the good and he leaves the waste. Now, not only, and here's the big chiddush, the novel idea, is not only are there just holy sparks contained in that food, which are inherent because there's life force in that food. That's how you know there's holy sparks in there. There's also souls of people in that food. Gilgulim. He says, neshamas of people are in that food. And therefore, he says, that when a person eats, the intention that he has while he's eating will determine whether he rectifies those souls or elevates those holy sparks or whether he sends them down into the world of impurity. So when a person eats out of physical desire for physical pleasure, he doesn't even really need the nourishment. He's just eating because he feels like it. And he doesn't make a bracha and he's doing it for selfish motives. So that is a very, very unholy act in the world of Kabbalah. That's a very, very negative act. Not only have you now taken the holy sparks that were contained in the food and sent them over into the forces of impurity, you've also taken the souls that were in that food and you've sent them over into the forces of impurity. Not only that, but when you absorb the nutrients and the life force from the food, whatever you do with the, that life force, with those calories, that will also determine if that food or that life force is elevated or sent down to the forces of impurity. So a person eats food and then he uses the energy to go do mitzvahs and learn Torah and do chesed and help poor people. So then he elevates all the energy that was contained in that food. If he eats that food and he goes out and parties and does averas and steals from people, so then he's now taken all the life force and the energy in that food and he's sent it down into the forces of evil and impurity. So a person, to, there's two aspects to the eating. There's the act of the eating itself, which has a few variables that are involved. Number one is the kavana that he has while he's eating, meaning why is he eating? Is it for the sake of serving God and because he needs the energy to serve God and to remain healthy and to serve him to the best of his ability? Or is it because he wants physical pleasure? There's the way in which he eats. Does he eat like an animal or like a refined human being? Uh, there's many halachas about how to eat properly at a table and not to take a huge piece of bread and stuff it into your mouth, but to break it into smaller pieces, right, to, to, to eat with dignity. Then there is whether he makes a bracha on the food or not, which is a major factor. If he recognizes that this food is a gift from God, then he elevates the food. Not only does he elevate it, but the Gemara says that until a person makes a bracha, the food does not belong to him. It belongs to God. A bracha is called a matir. It gives a person permission to eat the foods. So when he blesses God for that food, so essentially God says, now the food is yours. I've given it to you, and now you can eat it. So if he eats food without making a bracha, it's also as if he's stealing from God. So certainly he's not going to elevate the sparks in that sense. Once he's satiated from the food, does he make a bracha achrona after bracha and bless Hashem for the satiation that he feels? And that's, the, that's all in the act of the eating itself. And then the other aspect of eating is what we mentioned a second ago, is does, what does he do with the energy that he has extracted from that food? 
does he use it for positivity and for fulfilling the will of God, or to do averos and sins and to go against the will of God. So both of those are going to have a huge bearing on what happens to the sparks of holiness and to the souls that are contained within that food. So it's a really, really big deal um, when a person when a person eats. <laughs> it's a really big deal. That's why many tzaddikim will not eat meat during the week. They'll only eat on Shabbos. Because the more physical a food is, the, the, the more difficult it is to elevate the holy sparks. So for example, uh, by physical I mean the more life force that that food had, the higher on the food chain it is. So for example, to elevate mineral life is much easier than elevating animal life. So again, we mentioned previously there's the scale of, of life on Earth is there's domim, which is inanimate objects and mineral life. There's tomeach, which is plant life. There's chai, which is animal life. And there's medaber, which is human life. Now, every food, the higher you get on the chain, is really um, contained, containing all the other elements on the chain that are beneath it. So, for example, plants will suck up minerals from the soil. So a plant doesn't only contain plant life, it also contains mineral life. And animals will very often eat plants, or animals that eat plants. And they will then be absorbing up the mineral life that was absorbed into the plant, and the plant life that they're absorbing when they're eating it, or the animal that they ate that ate the plant that ate the mineral. So animals are containing all three levels of life. So there's a lot more holy sparks that are in those animals. And animals, you know, are much tastier, and they're, and, and they're, they're much more alive, the more live something is, so the more life force that's contained in that food, but that also means the harder it is to elevate, that's why it's also tastier and more delicious, right? Meats are much more easier to become carnal and physical and seek pleasure when you eat meat than it is when you have a salad, right? So why is that? So you say, oh, because meat's more delicious and salad's not, no. So the spiritual right, concept is that there's much more life force contained in that meat which is much more difficult to elevate because it's so much more potent than there is in that salad. So the salad has a much, uh, much smaller danger of being sucked into physicality and impurity because it's a lower form of life. How many people have a crazy desire to eat salt, right? Just to eat like mineral life. Like, it doesn't really happen. The minerals are almost, they come automatically. They're in the food. You don't even taste them. You don't enjoy them really um, because again, it's a lower form of life. So it has less potential for being used for the forces of impurity and physical pleasure. Uh, so that means that the higher the, the food on the chain, the harder it is to elevate, or the more kavana, I guess, the more pure intent that would be necessary to elevate it to the side of holiness. So meat is the hardest thing to elevate because it's the highest on the chain. It's the most delicious, it's the most carnal, it's the one that a person becomes an animal when he actually eats it. So tzaddikim, the righteous, they don't partake of meat during the week. Many Kabbalists do not eat meat during the week and they only eat it on Shabbos. So we'll discuss Shabbos soon, but Shabbos, the food is essentially pre-elevated. There's a mitzvah to enjoy yourself on Shabbos. The mitzvah itself is to actually physically enjoy the food. Where the rest of the week, if that's the reason you're eating, then you're actually sending the food down into the forces of evil and impurity. On Shabbos is different because the, God commanded us to enjoy that day and to enjoy the food on that day. So the food has to be pre-elevated because even if you don't have the right kavana, if your kavana at the very least is, I'm doing it because God told me to eat delicious food on Shabbos, which is pretty easy, so most people are thinking at the very least so then it becomes elevated assuming they made a bracha and they did it according to halacha obviously so, so what about the leftovers of shabbos like you said you have chicken so you eat that right away or no you shouldn't i have heard that there's kabbalists that, that do eat it during the week i'm not a kabbalist so i can't speak to them but there's uh, there was a, a sephardi kabbalist that lived in the neighborhood i lived in israel and he said that according to some opinions i believe he quoted the chida I don't want to miss but that's what I believe he said, that, that Shabbos food that was pre-elevated remains in its holy state during the week, so that he would eat Shabbos leftovers. But I don't know if it's agreed upon by everyone. But yeah, there is that concept out there. So, but Jews, and especially religious Jews, or people who would say a bracha, I mean, that's a very, very small percentage of the world, and forget about the history of the world. So what about all of the souls that are in these foods or in these animals, whatever, in that are not, don't have that opportunity? They just keep going through this cycle over and over and over until they finally... Yep. <laughs> it's a, I mean, we, we assume that it's usually going to be a, a negative thing to be reincarnated into food because, again, it's very hard to be elevated without any free will of your own. So you have to hope that you chance upon the right Jew that's gonna make the right bracha. But again, imagine how amazing it is 
for the apple that gets onto the you know the table of a Jew that's making a bracha and a blessing over the food and that has or is eating it for a mitzvah. I always told my son, what's a chicken's greatest wish on earth? It's to be eaten on Shabbos by a Jew, <laughs> for sure. To be have a kosher shechita, to be eaten by a Jew with a bracha on Shabbos, doesn't get better than that. Guaranteed elevation. So every chicken in the world is dreaming of making it to a Jewish Shabbos table. And since we said that God organizes everything, I mean, who, who decides what chicken gets on your plate? Which pack you reach for at, at Costco? Right? It's obviously Hashem organized that that food would get onto your table. So you can rest assured that whatever you're eating is an unbelievable gift for whatever sparks are in that food. Now, imagine, like you said, the percentage of the percentage of the percentage of food that actually gets onto a Jew's table. And now, we're going to recognize the great responsibility that a religious Jew has when he eats food, is he's going to decide if that food gets elevated and rectified or not, based on the way that he eats it and the intentions that he has when he eats it and whether he makes a bracha or not and what he does with that energy. So it's unbelievable the responsibility that a Jew has when he eats food. It's such a lofty one. And it's such a mute, the mute, right? It's such a my, tiny minority of food that's going to actually get to the right place where it can actually be elevated. And then the Jew's going to waste it because he just wanted to like have fun and, and eat for pleasure. So it's such a shame. It's a, really, it's a shame for whatever souls are in that food. So it's a great responsibility to, uh, to be a Jew and to actually get to eat these foods. <laughs> yeah, there's a question. Okay. So he says over here, in the Sefer Zichron Dvarim, Okay, so let's just let's just learn this inside for a minute. Al pi hayadua letinoko shel beis rabban shebechol davar meichel yesh nitzosas kedoshes v'neshamas magugalim harbe. In every morsel of food, there are many holy sparks and many reincarnated souls. Vayadei she adam ochel v'nitchazek kochel avodas habore v'oved achar kach im oso achiyus shehay b'meichel et Hashem izbarach yesh aliyah laotan neshamas hakedoshes. And through eating that food and using the energy that a person extracts from that food to serve Hashem, there is a tremendous elevation that takes place for those souls. V'zeh shulchan domel mis. And that's why the tables of, of a Jew is compared to the Mizbech, to the altar. Kilomar. The Mizbech Shomalash Michal Omed Umakri Valav Nishma Sisro. There is a concept that we find in the deeper Svarim that explain that there is a base of Mikdash down here and a base of Mikdash up there. In the base of Mikdash down here, so what do we sacrifice on Mizbech? Animals. In the Mizbech Shomala, in the Mizbech that exists in the spiritual world, first, who's the Kohen Gadol? So, it says Michal, the angel Michal. And what does he sacrifice on the Mizbeach? The souls of the righteous. And their greatest desire is to be sacrificed to God on the altar on high. So when it says that a person's table is like the Mizbeach, so he says it actually means that our table is like the Mizbeach in the higher worlds, where what is being sacrificed on them? Souls. Because in the food that we eat are contained these souls of people from previous lives that were reincarnated into the food. That's in the Gemara. That there's a Mizbech in the higher world that Michal sacrifices souls. And so too, our table is one in which we can elevate those souls to their source. And so too, our table is one in which we can elevate those souls to their source. Which I believe it says your side tonight. So. Very nice. A person should make sure that he doesn't fall into the category of Yeravim Benavat, who in the Navi was a very wicked person, who wasn't only a sinner himself, but he caused others to sin, which is the worst. The worst is not only when you're a sinner, that's your own decision, but to cause others to sin, it doesn't get worse than that. So he says, make sure you're not like Yeravim Benavat. How so? Because if you eat foods, that have many Jewish souls that are reincarnated and contained in that food. And afterward, you go with that vitality and that life force that you've taken from that food that contains those souls. And you anger God by sinning. He also sins with those souls that attach themselves to him through the food that he ate, that he was supposed to elevate. So he's not only sinning himself, he's causing them to sin by using their life force to carry out a sin. Not only did he not elevate them, but he actually increased their sins. They came back into this world to hopefully become rectified. But unfortunately, they went onto the table of a sinner, and now they were sent even lower. He says, in that way, a person could be like a Rav Benavat. He says, that's what I heard. 
from his holy so holy in his holy name so he says actually before a person eats he should look into his actions and decide how, what he's going to do with this with his vitality he should uh, the shulchan aruch says the person should only eat what's absolutely necessary um to be healthy which could be a lot of you know a good amount of food we're not saying to be emaciated but we're saying to be healthy and then he says and make sure that when you eat that food you have intention to use it to serve god and not for the physical pleasure now you can also enjoy the food while you're eating it that's why god made food delicious but that shouldn't be the person's sole intention when he's eating it should be for the sake of having energy to serve god okay now listen to this scary story very interesting so this is a story from Yehuda Patia. There was this pious individual. He would fast for the entire week. There were many righteous tzaddikim that would fast for the entire week. They would drink, obviously, so they wouldn't die, but they would not eat any food all week. And then on Shabbos, they would eat. And when he ate on Shabbos, he would actually have a shinoi vest, and this is a discussion in the Shulchan Aruch, which means he would actually feel terrible and get extremely sick because he hadn't eaten all week, so his body was not used to that food. And he decided I'm going to fast on Shabbos as well. So this person was basically going to eat the very, very bare minimum to survive. If he got the haskama, the agreement of the Rabbanim that would say that this is a good idea. They caught him to Shal al Shal Shabbos. And before he was able to ask about fasting on Shabbos, he saw in a dream two people that were handing him two plates. One had fruit on it, and the other had vegetables on it. And they said, Please get up and eat. And he didn't want to eat, because in his dream, he assumed he was fasting, which was his minog all week. He never ate. And these people kept pushing him until he was almost embarrassed. They said, please eat, please eat, please eat. And he didn't want to eat. And he refused, said under no circumstances. And then they got angry at him. And they said to each other, okay, get up. Let's take the food with us. This person doesn't want to revive the dead. He doesn't want the revival of the dead. Then he woke up from his dream. That was his dream. And when he woke up from his dream, he was very afraid of this dream. What happened? because he was concerned that maybe he wasn't going to merit to be revived with the dead. So he sent a messenger to go ask this great rabbi of Yehuda Patia to tell him what this dream meant. And he told the person, please don't tell them who I am because I don't want this person, the rabbi to know that I'm a hidden tzaddik, whatever it was. Okay, so he says, Ki hine, yish shamos b'nei adam b'maim there are many souls of human beings that are reincarnated in water, salt, bread, fruit, meat, fish, birds. And when a person makes a bracha on them when he eats them, so then he rectifies that soul, and they go finish serving their time in Gehenna. So again, it wasn't like, that's it, they're done. Clearly, if they came back as a food or an animal, so they have to go back to be purified, but it still was an elevation for them. However, if he doesn't make a bracha on them, so then there's tremendous pain for those souls that were not meriting the rectification. So he says that when a person eats fruit without a bracha, when he leaves this world, so he's also going to have to come down into this, into this world as a food because he didn't eat with a bracha, so his reincarnation is going to be to come down as a food. And Hashem will ensure that he will make it to the table of someone who eats without a bracha. So that he won't get his rectification because he denied that soul that he was eating that food, that was, the soul is contained in that food, he denied its rectification, so he's going to be denied his rectification in the future. Because Hashem does, Mida Kenegan Mida, Hashem does tit for tat. And that's the secret that is written in the Pasuk, Ki lo ala lechem levado yichi adam, ella al kol mote pi Hashem. The Pasuk says, because not only on bread does a person live, rather he lives also through everything that is spoken by the, by the mouth of Hashem. So what does that mean? Perish. Ki lo al yedei achilat halechem levado belo bracha yichia ha'adam ha'melgogelet belechem ahu yitzbeitukan. Because not only through the eating of the food that of that bread are those souls that are contained within that bread elevated. Ela al kol motzeh pi Hashem. Rather, everything that comes out of a person's mouth for the sake of Hashem. She ha bracha shemavarachalav. Also, it's necessary for the brachos to be made on that food the blessings to elevate those souls that are contained within the food. And that's how the soul that is reincarnated in that food will ultimately live.
That's what the Pasuk means. That's what he says. The Oto Isha Sher Chalam Chalam And this guy who had this dream, since he was fasting all of the week, and he didn't have any specific Avera that justified his fasts, so he caused many sparks of Kedusha and many souls that were reincarnated in the food to remain without the rectification, because he was clearly a very holy person. And therefore, heaven was telling him that he no longer had to fast, and he should get up and eat, so that the souls in the food would be rectified through his eating. And since he didn't want to eat, that's why those souls told him that he's not going to, that he does, he's not interested in Tchiyas Amesim. And it wasn't that he wasn't going to receive Tchiyas Amesim, because he didn't do anything wrong, but it was that he wasn't interested in helping others reach their rectification to be revived with the dead. So that's what those souls were telling him, because he didn't want to elevate that food. So it's a tremendous responsibility when a person eats food that he literally has souls of individuals sitting in that food, and he can choose, it's up to him, whether he's going to rectify them or not. And in another source here, it says that a person should always assume that who is in that food that he's eating, it's kind of weird to think like this, but his relatives, as I mentioned previously, that any reincarnated souls that are going to cross over a person's plate, no pun intended, but it also means, right, anyone they're going to interact with in their life or the food that they're going to eat is probably going to have something to have, have done with that person in the past. It's going to be a replay, right? Otherwise, why did that food make it to his plate? It could have gone to some other Jew that probably had an interaction with that soul. So usually it's going to be someone that the person had interaction with. So it says that families, family members, souls of the departed, <laughs> are going to be in his food. So he says that's extra motivation, that when a person eats, he should imagine, this is my great-grandfather. <laughs> I shouldn't picture it like that, but <laughs> there's some aspect of his soul that is in this food, right? Not the whole soul always comes down. We said that souls can be broken up into different pieces, different parts. So there's something in this food of my ancestors that needs to be elevated. And therefore, he should look at that food and say, I'm going to make the best bracha ever. I'm going to have kavana that this is for the sake of God. And when I eat it, I'm going to use that energy to go and learn Torah or do chesed or prepare for Shabbos or whatever else is in the category of mitzvah. That's what you should think. And every time he eats, he should think that. He should make a great bracha achrona. And it's such a good mechaya. It's a, it gives a person life and meaning to his eating. To not just say, oh, there's a mitzvah to eat like a mensch. You should eat like a good person with dignity. No. <laughs> the, one of the reasons why the, the, the Ramchal says it's important to learn Kabbalah or Kabbalistic concepts is because it adds so much flavor and color to a person's mitzvahs. Right? You can't do a mitzvah with so much excitement if it's just like, this is what it is, and do it. I mean, you, that's the ultimate reason we do mitzvahs, not to say that this is in place of that, because if God commanded it, that's why we do it. But that doesn't mean that a person should just do it like a robot. God wants a person's heart and soul to be in the mit- mitzvah. So therefore, he gave him what's called Ta'amei HaMitzvahs. That means the reason for the mitzvahs. Tam is a reason. So you look in the Sefer HaChinuch, he goes through all the reasons for the mitzvahs. Now, there's no real reason for the mitzvah. The reason for the mitzvah is because Hashem said to do it, therefore you have to do it. But the reasons are to give it flavor and to give it life and color, which is why the same word tam, which means reason, also means flavor. Tam is a flavor. Because tam eha mitzvahs means the flavor of the mitzvahs. The reasoning behind the mitzvahs gives the mitzvahs flavor so that a person can perform them with excitement and with meaning and with inspiration. So when a person eats food, so this, this really broadens his concept of eating. It's not just a mitzvah and there's, there's guidelines in the Shulchan Aruch about how to eat and how to make the bracha, when to make the bracha, but now he's actually rectifying souls. Not only random souls, but very likely souls that were connected to him in the previous life or his ancestors. And it's his job to elevate them. That's why they came across his plate and he can choose to elevate them or not. So it's an unbelievable responsibility that a person has when he gets that food on his plate. And, in, and specifically, um, one thing that, that, that is brought down in the Svarim is fish, is that tzaddikim are reincarnated as fish. And therefore, there is a very strong minhag that's brought down by the Gra in particular to eat fish at every meal on Shabbos. Because Hashem will ensure that the fish of the tzaddikim make it onto the Shabbos table. Since fish are always going to be tzaddikim, so therefore, whatever fish you buy for Shabbos, you can almost rest assured that that herring, that salmon, that filter fish, is a tzaddik. <laughs> There's a tzaddik in there. And his dream is to be eaten on Shabbos at the table of a holy Jew. So you have to understand that the food, there, this also explains why there's this concept of shirayim by a Rebbe. You go to a tzaddik and he eats food and you see the chassidim, they put their hands out and they pass around like a filter fish and everyone gets a little piece, everyone gets a little piece of his challah, everyone gets a little piece of his wine, a little piece of his, of his like any food that's on his plate, they literally give out everything. And most people say, well, what a weird thing, what they're worshipping this guy. 
They're eating his food like it's a holy thing. So, no, the concept is because when he took that food and made a bracha, he elevated so many holy sparks and so many holy souls in that food that now it's been pre-elevated by that tzaddik. He's elevated. Now, when he gives it to you, you are now experiencing the kedusha, the holiness that has now been activated in that food. So you eat the food of the tzaddik because the tzaddik is the one who uses all the right kavanas. He only eats what necessary. On Shabbos, he elevates the food. So imagine how lucky that piece of chicken was that it got onto the tzaddik's plate. That's a dream come true, right? That, that tzaddik. So that doesn't have to be the tzaddik. Every piece of food that comes across any religious Jew's plate, that's a very lucky piece of food. Very, very lucky. So he says as well, not only the food, but even the trees, the plant life, there could be souls in that as well. And he says specifically, um, Ben Ishchai brings that when a person goes out and makes birkas ha'ilanos, so there's a very deep concept that there's souls of tzaddikim that are in those fruit trees that are blossoming. blossoming. And therefore, there's a lot of kavanas. We have a Sephardi Siddur where it says that bracha, there's all these hiratons before to elevate all of those souls. So many things that we do when we're using plant life and animal life and food in this world, you always assume that you're elevating them. Lulav and Estrog, all these things, they all have souls in them. So this is such a crazy, wild concept for most people because they assume even if you believe in reincarnation, certainly it's only talking about people. And the answer is no. It's very clearly talking about animals, plant life, and even mineral life. And it's included in all of those. And the scary part is, for those reincarnations, the only tikkun, the only rectification, is if the person who ultimately uses those items or eats that food is going to do it in a way that elevates them. So it's really up to us. So now you see that a person in the world has a tremendous responsibility, not only for his own mitzvahs, his own averus, and not only to help rectify the souls that are in the bodies around him, but he also has a responsibility to rectify the souls that are contained in the food and the objects that come into his domain, that come into his surrounding world. So a person, you know, there's, there's a concept by Hashavah Saveda that the object itself, when it's lost, returning a lost object, the mitzvah is very, very great. It's a tremendous mitzvah. Because the object itself is crying and screaming that it wants to go back to its master because it wants to go back to its owner. Because the owner is the only one who can rectify whatever sparks are in that object. So by Hashavah Saveda, you're returning the item back to its owner, but you're actually connecting whatever life force is in that object back to its source where it can be rectified. So that's why stealing and these things are, are not only terrible in the moral and ethical sense, but you've just taken something that is shayach, it's connected to that soul, and you've taken it away from that soul, and now it's never going to reach its rectification. So there's a whole interplay of, of objects and life force and, and foods and people that's taking place in the world that God's organizing, and anytime you step out of line halachically, so you're guaranteeing that that thing will not be rectified, it will not reach its ultimate destination, its ultimate purpose. I have a question. Yeah. Just like you were explaining how dogs and whatever animals, they have the rectification. Like the dog, the So, for vegetables and fruits, so you have garlic, and you have onion, and you have all the vegetables. Those are sharp foods. How does that translate to the person who... Uh, yeah. So I can't, yeah, 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 I definitely hear, yeah, like you're saying that a sharp person is sweet, is, the apple is sweet. So I'm sure there's probably, I mean, I, I doubt it's random, but I haven't seen anything here that speaks about what you have to do to get reincarnated as what food. But when it comes to animals, it's all, I, I'm not going to go through all of them, a lot of them are through different illicit relations, usually it's something like that that causes different animals to be reincarnated into different animals, mm -hmm. but they go through probably 20 animals in this book, that if you do this, you get reincarnated as a raven, and this you get reincarnated as a pig, and this you get reincarnated as the dog, so that they go through all of it, or a cat, and these things, usually it's always sins that cause a person to be reincarnated as an animal, because he acted like an animal. So Medica Negamida, he goes into an animal, and usually something about that animal has something to do with the sin that the person committed. So it's very rare, other than fish, that we say that Tzaddikim get reincarnated as fish, it's very rare that you're going to see um, a person get reincarnated in an animal as something positive. There's many stories that, uh, you know, certain Tzaddikim were sitting and learning Torah, and every day there would be the same, you know, lizard that would, like, you know, go to the window and be right there, or the same bird that would land by the tzaddik when he's learning, and he would say, there's stories where they would say, I forgive you, and then it would fly away and never come back. 
So sometimes it was coming back to ask for forgiveness. It was someone in a previous life who had wronged the person, so they had to come back and wait for the person to forgive them. So I always try that when a bug is bothering me. It doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> you have a fly flying around. Ask, try it. It's not going to work usually. I was just asking but it works. No, it doesn't work. It, it never worked. But you know, there's a lizard that every day where I learn at my desk in, in, in my house, there's the same exact lizard. I mean, eventually he'll die, I imagine, because <laughs> out of old age. But you know, since a baby, when I was a baby, it's literally always there on the window right by me. Same exact lizard, always there. So I tried to, to give him forgiveness, but he wants to come back anyway. But maybe he wants to learn Torah. Maybe he wants to learn Torah. Yeah, you never know. You never know. But these are, yeah, with, with animals too. If an animal is doing something weird, um, you know, there's stories with cats that would always follow this person around and they did crazy things that they would never leave him alone. And like, so either it's a really needy animal or usually the assumption out of, after what we learned tonight is that animal has some connection to that person's soul and he needs to be rectified through that person. We saw this story with the Arizal, with the woman that we spoke about previously, the woman who had an affair with her neighbor, and then he came back as a dog to attack the woman. So, you know, sometimes uh, dog attacks, it actually says in the Sefer, if someone gets bitten by a dog, it's a sign that he spoke Lashon Hara, um, and that's why he got bitten by the dog. In that case, we saw the person was an adulteress, and that's why she was bitten by the dog. So getting attacked by a dog is not a good sign, because the dog is usually a person that was reincarnated for some bad sin. If you get bitten by the dog, that means that that dog is paying a person back for something negative that he's done. So, not a good thing to get bit by a dog. But you see that there's an interplay between the animals and the people. That there's, and, and that's part of the previous lives that they've lived. What about the concept of um, shuba that we're all supposed to do here in this life, in our lives, that we give it? We do, we're supposed to do, supposedly do a shuba. So this is if they didn't do tshuva, obviously. What? This is if they did not do tshuva. Okay. So they have a sin that they need to come back and rectify. But if oh, a person yes. repents and he does tshuva and his sins are forgiven, okay. so it could be that he's totally forgiven. But even if he gets tshuva, unless he has the highest, highest level tshuva, there's still rectifications that need to be made. If a person stole money from someone else, even if he did tshuva, if he didn't pay back that money, he might have to come back into the world, or he will have to come back into the world to somehow give back that money. Well, they about tshuva big movement and everything. So before they were in the secular world and they non-kosher. So that's called the Tinoch Shanishba, because that was, that's called the Tinoch Shanishba, a child that was kidnapped okay, so by non-Jews. So, yeah, they, they, were, they were never held accountable for that because God put them into that situation where they didn't know any better and they couldn't have known. They were a child and they couldn't have known any better. They didn't make a conscious decision. So clearly that was part of their rectification. There's something with a Gilgul that probably took place in that, in, in, in that situation. Um, but yeah, any Gilgul, we assume that there's some rectification taking place. And none of this applies to non-Jews, non-Jewish souls? We saw that non-Jewish souls had become reincarnated by, when we said that Zimri and Cosby was actually Shechem, came back so as a Jew. So, so it can, so it's it rare. Can yeah, it, it, and as far as Sefer says, it's, very, it's much more rare, and it's much more rare for women to be reincarnated as well. Um, it says that it happens. It's not impossible. We saw in some of the stories we went through that women were reincarnated, but it's Jewish much women? less likely. Yeah, Jewish women. Because... Perhaps because they don't have a, uh, a chiyuv of learning Torah, so they have less to rectify. In, in, in one of the svarim, I didn't quote it yet tonight, but um, here in the chida, in the name of the Arizal, he says, if a person in this world finds that he has a propensity for learning a specific aspect of Torah, whether it's halacha, or chumish, or gemara, or kabbalah, and he finds that he's just drawn to that very strongly, that means that in a previous life, he did not fulfill his mission in learning that aspect of Torah. So he was missing that piece. So he came down, and therefore, there's a concept in Gemara, Ein Adam Lomed Elamash Libo Chafetz. A person doesn't learn that which his heart does not desire. So he's naturally drawn towards something. So the deeper meaning, according to Rizal, is that he's drawn towards the Torah that is, his soul is lacking. So uh, it was actually said about Rechaim Vital, which was a very, very lofty soul. Yeah, Rizal told him he had the neshama of the Magid Mishnah who is a commentary on the Rambam, who's one of the greatest rabbis that ever lived, but he wrote his commentary on the revealed aspects of Torah. And evidently, he spent so much time on the revealed aspects of Torah, he never learned Kabbalah and the hidden aspects of Torah. So Rechaim Vital was sent back into the world with that same neshama to learn the hidden aspects of Torah, and that's why the Arizal said he was only brought into the world to teach Rechaim Vital, to give him his rectification. So you see that, you know, the learning takes a lot of... Uh, a person needs to learn the whole Torah, whether in this lifetime or through many lifetimes. Like more, the, the Pirkei Abba says, Lo Alecha HaMalacha Ligmor, you don't have to finish the word, that you don't have to finish all the work, but you're also not putter, you're not exempt from, from putting in the work, which in this context means Hashem's going to give you more times to come down and finish the work, but you still have to do as much as you can. Try to learn as much of the Torah as you can, and you have to come back down to finish it. So women that don't have that chiyuv, so it could be that's a huge area of reincarnation that they are suddenly exempt from, even though it says they do come down, but not as much as men, because they suddenly have the whole Torah that they don't have to learn. So... Can we understand from that that women really have already 
a lot of their neshama's already been rectified, and that's why this is sort of like the end? Or we don't look at it that way? We, we also look at women as the other half of, of, of a neshama. I mean, whoever they're going to marry, so that's also a deep aspect of their souls and for the children that they're going to that they're going to have. So they're, they they can become reincarnated to be to, to, to play a part in the story of the greater neshama that they're coming down for. But when he says that they don't get reincarnated, so I don't know what it means that there's more female neshamas that are in like waiting in the you know in the holding tank than there are male neshamas because there are always new ones that come down. The male ones keep recycling. I don't know how it works out in the numbers, but I'm sure that. You know, a male neshama, even if he has to come down to fix something, very often his female counterpart will also have to come to enable him to complete mm -hmm. something, very often. You know, the Gemara says that the schar of the nashim, that their ultimate olam haba, will be the, the work they did to enable and push their husbands to learn Torah and to send their kids to, to go learn Torah. Mm -hmm. So you see that as, as, an, as an enabler, that's also part of their mission in this world. Clearly, they don't have the same mitzvahs that the men do, so obviously God just said, you have literally one quarter of the responsibility that a man does in terms of your 24-hour mitzvahs that are upon you. Well, guess what? That doesn't mean God wants them to sit around doing nothing. They clearly have a serious mission on this world. It's just not the same as a man. So therefore, they can be sent into the world to rectify 20 other people because they have more time on their hands. They don't have to sit in the base measures to learn Torah all day where a man has a chiv every second to be learning, so unless he's doing something else that God wants him to do, he has to be learning. So a woman clearly has much more um, flexibility in her mission and what she's there to do. So they could come down for that. Maybe it's not for their own tikkun, it's to help other people reach their tikkun. But women are inherently more perfect. That, that's brought in all of us for them, that, mm -hmm. that a female soul is, is already rectified to a greater extent than a man's. It's, it's lacking, that's why it doesn't have the mitzvahs. The mitzvahs are because you're lacking so much. A man needs to build so much. A woman already comes like pre-perfected. She needs to maintain that perfection, which is very, very difficult, and to enable others to, to accomplish their goal. And through that, she gets all of their schar. The Rabbi Akiva had his 24,000 students. He said, he said, Shalih v'shalachem shalach. His wife came after not seeing him for 24 years, and she fell at his feet and grabbed his legs. She hadn't seen him in so long, and the students came to push her off. They thought it was a crazy lady coming to grab her via Kiva, like the greatest sage in the whole world. And he said, no, let her be. He says, all that's mine and all that's yours is hers. Meaning she had the schar, the merit of Rabbi Akiva and 24,000 students. So she was probably, in the next world, the highest neshama you could ever imagine, as good as it gets because she enabled all that to take place. And if you read through the, all the Gemaras, it wasn't just that she waited at home while Biyakiva went away for 24 years. She built her Biyakiva. She sent them to Cheder with all the kids. They were going to laugh at him, and she said, don't worry, they're not going to laugh at you. And she, she whatever, the whole Gemara, but what she did to, to build up his confidence and eventually went to learn, she built him. She created her Biyakiva. So Biyakiva said, I'm only here because of her. And you're only here because I'm here, and I'm only here because of her. And therefore, everything that we have is all hers. So you see, her life was very different than his. She wasn't gathering 24,000 students and learning Torah all day. She was really waiting for him at home for 24 years. Um, but nevertheless, and she was sending him money and food and whatever it was, but she had the greatest merit in the entire world. So her soul obviously has a different mi mission. So female souls come to the world for a totally different purpose than a man's, obviously, by definition, because of their responsibility and their mitzvahs. Um, and for that reason, perhaps they have much less of a propensity to be reincarnated because they don't have as much to do and accomplish. They don't have the amount of mitzvahs that a man has. So therefore, they can't make as many mistakes, which means they have to come into the world pre-perfected because they don't need those mitzvahs. And they have a whole different mission than a man. So that's, uh, that'll, be, that'll be a good reason why they don't need to be reincarnated as much. So do we believe that men don't come as women and women don't come as men? So no, women, no, they, 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 they do switch places. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe if we do have another show, we'll speak about children that reincarnated. They were reincarnated after the Holocaust. There's a whole book, I think it was called We Were Here Before by Sari mm -hmm. Chavit Rigler. And, uh, and she goes through stories where little boys that died in the Holocaust were now, and the w people are telling the story and had the dreams and the visions, they were women. So you saw that boys came back into female bodies. So that could also be it. Obviously, they, the, soul, the soul was changed in a certain way, where it's now female, but. Um, but it was that soul that lived that previous life. Another question. If you come down as a fruit and you don't get rectified, what's your next step? I imagine you come down again as another, another, as fruit. An, as another fruit, another food, whatever, and you hope that you get uh, that your, your, your son or your grandson or your great-grandson is going to be making brachas. Another reason to ensure that your ancestors, sorry, that your progeny um, 
keep Torah and mitzvahs because they're certainly going to help you reach your rectification. Like we said, souls are interconnected. So if your soul needs to be fixed, it's not going to go to some random place in the middle of nowhere to be fixed. It's probably going to have something to do with the souls that are a chain uh, link to yours. So it's really important. So then maybe that answers my question that when we um, ask Hashem to, you know, um, that a soul should go higher and higher, and he should have an aliyah on high, and the soul should rest in peace, or, you know, the classic thing you say for a departed loved one or person. So, like, what does that mean exactly in the context of this, mm. this information? Like, if they're just a fruit, or, they're, you know, we're, they're coming down as a something, a dog, uh, God forbid, whatever. So I said only and part of the neshama can come they, down. Their soul should have an aliyah. There's only parts of that we said neshamas right. can be bro- neshamas can be broken up into many parts. There could be a part that stays up there, a part that comes down, and we don't ever have to. The beginning of the year was, don't ever think that you know that this apple is my great grandfather. Right? Then you're a little crazy, but you can assume that that great gra- that the apple is your great grandfather. That's a good way to eat because then you're going to make sure to have the proper thoughts and the proper bracha and the proper intention. But um, we don't have to worry about those things. When you okay, do good so deeds, you elevate the neshama because their merit of having raised you or created you or been part of the chain right. reaction that created you has now generated mitzvot in the world. So therefore, it, it accrues to their account. So you're saying then, because there's all these little pieces of the soul, because nobody could ever be perfect trying to rectify themselves down here. So even a great grandfather who was, a, let's say, a good person, a good man, he went to shul, and, he was a good Jew. Um, in other words, he didn't complete his journey. He could come back as that apple. Yeah, for sure. I mean, because we yeah, don't it could be good people, and he probably is. did. If he got onto a Jew's plate, that's going to make a bracha, a from Jew that's going to make a bracha and eat him for the right reasons. You would probably assume that was a pretty good neshama. It just needed a few little wow. uh, things that needed to be tweaked. Certainly, if he came back as a fish, we said he's a tzaddik. Tzaddikim, wow. but they obviously need to fix something. For there's a reason they came back as a fish and didn't just stay up there. Uh, I don't think any soul wants to come down and have a gilgul. That's pretty much a, a theme you see throughout that nobody wants to be reincarnated. But when it takes place, it was for their benefit. And if God ensures that that fish goes onto someone's plate on Shabbos and that person eats it with the right intentions, so clearly he did something right in the previous life to get that merit to be rectified so easily and so quickly. So does this also um, apply to a child? Because you, you dealt with one, one class of children who die early, God forbid. Mm-hmm. Does that also apply to a child under 13? That unfortunately tragically pass away yeah we don't know yeah they can come back as yeah they can come back as anything we don't know that that, that's that they don't discuss if like who comes back as what um we just know if person sins they come back as negative things but we they might need rectifications in different ways why they come back as a child and die early so clearly that soul also needs to be fixed in some way so you know that child that lived two years you told the story and was starting to live for two years and then yeah that was part of the rectification if a child dies young so it means it was part of the rectification do they need more rectification i don't know yeah, we don't know if it always works out on the first try or if little pieces need to come back down. But, uh, but that's a concept, and therefore, next time you eat, make sure you have the right intentions, you make a very nice bracha, and in that way you'll be saving your great-grandfather, maybe. Wow. Thank you.